Well, good evening, church. I'm uh, thankful that you're here today. I was concerned some of you might get caught up in the Star Wars hoopla and decide to watch Empire Strikes Back again. But uh, it's good to be in church. Uh, very thankful for this church. Thankful for that song, Oh, I Love Jesus. What a great way to start tonight. And it's National Day of Prayer, so we got a lot going on today. Uh, I would like to, excuse me, I'd like to draw your attention tonight. We're going to be reading from John chapter 14. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. And lately I've been uh, reading this chapter often. I think there's so much to glean from it. It's just uh, a great testament of uh, what Jesus is, what he's done for us who he is. Uh, I had a friend that went into glory a couple weeks ago, and she was in hospice care. And when I went to go see her, uh, I read this chapter to her, and it, it just it brought some light to her, to her eyes, and it really brought up her countenance tremendously. So starting in verse 1, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. This is Jesus speaking, by the way. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go you know, and the way you know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest now that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Now just prior to this passage, Jesus and his disciples had gathered in the upper room for what is known as the Last Supper. He knew that his time on earth had come to its conclusion, and he wanted to give the twelve an idea of what was to come. Jesus acknowledges that he is Master and Lord after washing their feet, and uses the act of service as something that all of his followers should emulate and do unto each other. You see, Jesus understands that Satan will manipulate Judas Iscariot into betraying him in the hopes of destroying God's plan for reconciling man to him. He even tells Judas to go what he intends to do so that the Son of Man be glorified and God be glorified in him. This is the only way for God's plan to be fulfilled so that man's sin can be rightfully atoned for. Father, I just thank you for today. I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ what he means and what he's done and what he continues to do. And so I pray, Father, that the words that are spoken today would just touch our hearts and minds, that you would reveal things to us that we need to know better about you and equipping us into reaching this lost and dying world. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, according to some estimates, there are roughly 4,200 religions churches, denominations, religious bodies, faith groups, tribes, cultures, movements, and ultimate concerns. And with so many choices, we're led to believe that all of them will produce the desired effect, the desired result of an afterlife in heaven. So in 2020, Pew Research Center, they did a census of the worldwide faith population. And as Steve Harvey would say, the top four answers are on the board. At four, we have Buddhism, which consists of 5.06%. 
At number three, we have secular, non-religious, agnostic, and atheist. These four categories combined come to 15.58%. Islam comes in at number two at 24.9%. And then Christianity is number one at 31.11%. Now, all four of the faiths or beliefs are going to say that they are the way. They'll say that they're composed of the real truth, and they will tout that they have the answers to life. So let's take a look at all three individually, as we see in verse uh, 6. And then let's compare them to what the world conveys by man's own creative thinking. The way. Jesus tells us in the passage that He is the way. And He can make this statement because He is God. He says in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and my Father are one. In fact, He was God even before mankind existed. Jesus, that is. We read that in John chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now all other faiths are going to say that they are the way to God, but they're speaking of false gods. These gods were created by fallible men. They are mere idols with their roots connected to the master deceiver, Satan himself. Now Muslims... They worship one all-knowing God known as Allah. And followers of Islam aim to live a complete submission to Allah. They believe that nothing can happen without Allah's permission. But humans do have free will. Secularism, on the other hand, is simply a framework for ensuring equality throughout society. And this is seen in politics, It's seen in education, the law, and elsewhere for believers and non-believers alike. Non-religious, agnostic, and atheist views seek no direction from any source and therefore go the way that they feel is best. There's no foundation to work from and the follower is robbed of understanding their created purpose. And then there's Buddhism. Buddhism is based on the teachings of Siddhartha Gautama, or commonly known as the Buddha. And the main principles of this belief system are karma, rebirth, and impermanence. That is to say that nothing lasts, and therefore, you have no idea which way you're going. Now we know, church, that God gave His beloved Son, Jesus, for fallen and depraved men and women like myself, so that we might become God's children too. We understand this. But in order to gain the title of son or daughter of God, one must acknowledge that Jesus is the only way for atonement. We see this in John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received Him, to them gave power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. We also read in the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter 56, verse 5, Even unto them I will give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than sons and daughters, sons of daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Allah cannot say that, can He? Buddha certainly cannot say that. And the secularists, agnostics, and atheists, well, they really have nothing to say at all most of the time, do they? So if the census poll taken a couple years ago is to believe as being accurate, then over 70% of the world's population is going in the wrong direction. Now, i got to believe that this number is actually generously lower than the actual truth if we look around today. But regardless of the findings through this survey, as Christ followers, we look around and we see that most people, 
Most people have their faith plugged into the wrong spiritual GPS, do they not? They're listening to the wrong folks. They're reading the wrong directions. Our world's a mess and the popular behavior that these false religions are producing will eventually lead them, lead them at a place that the Bible calls hell. And I know it's a word that society does not want to hear, but it is the truth. And far too often we do not share the proper way that will change their course from the wrong way to the right way. For one reason or another, we stay in our safe circles and rarely venture outside of them to speak about the only way. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of reasons why I don't. You know, I don't want to be labeled a a hater or intolerant. Those aren't good words to be labeled. But then I look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. It's rather ironic that the non-believers of God's truth rally against those that follow Jesus, and they often take hatred and intolerance to a whole whole other level. You see, the Bible characterizes these haters of truth as being spiritually undiscerned. And the only way to know, the only truth that they know, I should say, and follow is provided to them by their father. And we know who their father is. Their father is Satan. We also fear causing division, do we not? We don't like that. We don't like to divide things. Who wants to be that person? The one that comes in and causes a riff. But then if we look at Matthew chapter 10, and we look at verses 34 and 35, this is Jesus speaking. And he says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Huh. That's not something that we normally think about, do we, when we think about Jesus? You see, Jesus is saying that He is the dividing line between fact and fiction. You're either for me and my truth, or you're against me and you're shackled to the world's lie. So rely on the Creator to direct you to eternal life or perish as you blindly exalt the created. And then when I have opportunities to share the good news of Jesus Christ, you know, I I, I start getting in my head and I start thinking, ah, boy, I don't want to be rejected. If I talk about Jesus here, they're going to shun me. You're going to treat me like an outcast, and I want to be accepted. Isaiah 53, 3 says, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. You know, Jesus knows these feelings all too well. Once he revealed himself to be God, he received unmatched scrutiny and rejection. I can't even begin to comprehend the feelings of loneliness that Jesus must have felt. What was going through his mind as he hung on that tree with the weight of humanity's sin cast upon him? And I am concerned what the guy who's taking my money for my coffee might think if I slip him a track and Tell them about Jesus. And with that perfect act of submission to God's authority, Jesus on the cross submitting, that's the example that we should follow. You know, why do I struggle to share the gospel? When I struggle to share the gospel, I need to think about that. 
I need to be mindful of that. I need to bring that to the forefront of my thoughts. If Jesus was willing to die for me, what's it going to cause to share the gospel with this guy who's down and out, who everyone's overlooking? Now, man's pride and ego allows him to believe that his way is the best. And this comes into play when defending a false idol or religious faith. But God has something different to say about this train of thought, this way of living. We read in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end of thereof are the ways of death. Now every day we make countless decisions, do we not? Some of them are big, some of them are small. I think of simple decisions that I make on a daily basis, you know. What should I wear today? That takes me about three seconds, tops. My wife, on the other hand, she plans it out the night before. Hey, do I need a second cup of coffee or a third? Might need that fourth on the way home from work. Do I even bother wasting my time by turning on the Yankees game? You know, then there's a, there's a difficult decisions we have to make. The decisions that require a sacrifice. Do I keep my kids in public school and have them subjected to the demonic rhetoric that's used to shape their mind and way of thinking? Well, if I do that, there goes the new car. Oh, I really want that new car. The kids have trashed mine. It's not looking so pretty anymore. Do I drop everything to go help the widow down the road when she needs something instead of relaxing on the couch? That's a tough call. Now this might sound trivial, and it's, it's meant to sound trivial, but that's what people do every day when it comes down to their spiritual immortality. Is it not? They lay their trust in something that's quick and easy, convenient and popular. They don't want to have to sacrifice too much for today because it would rob them of the pleasures of this world, would it not? They don't see that the end will only bring torment and destruction and ultimate separation from God. And so they gamble away eternity with God in paradise for the crumbs that the devil offers. And they're so willing to scarf those down, are they not? So not only is Jesus the way, but He also says that He is the truth. And Jesus not only says, says this, but uh, we know it, do we not? You know, you just know it. Aren't you just glad that Jesus revealed Himself to you and, and you had the eyes open and the wherewithal to say, hey, right, that's right, that's the truth, I believe it. Now Muslim scholars, they reject the four Gospels. They say they're not the original teachings of Jesus and they say that they've been corrupted over time. Now the doctrine of preservation in regard to Scripture... What that means is that the Lord has kept His Word intact as to its original meaning. Preservation simply means that we can trust the Scriptures because God has sovereignly overseen the process of transmission over the centuries. Now, we don't possess the original writings. What we do have are thousands of manuscripts from which the original writings can be ascertained. And by thorough examination and comparison of those manuscripts, it's determined what the original writing stated. This does not affect the accuracy of Scripture one bit. Nor does it mean that God has not preserved His Word. God has supernaturally kept and preserved His Word. Jesus told us this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass... One jot or one tittle shall in no wise, wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now, if you're not aware of this, the job of the early scribes was to make exact copies of the Scripture. 
They were very meticulous and practiced scrupulous precision by counting all the letters in a given book and noting the middle letter of the book. They would then do the same for the copy to make sure it matched. They employed such time-consuming and painstaking methods to ensure its accuracy. And what I love about Scripture is how Scripture interprets Scripture. You can go from one book to another and see the exact verse or terminology or meaning found. And Jesus again affirms that God's Word will not pass away in three exact and separate accounts found in the Gospels. In Matthew 24, 35, it says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. In the book of Mark, chapter 13, verse 31, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And then again in Luke, chapter 21, verse 33, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Amazing. Three different separate gospel accounts written by three different men at three different places, three different times, and God chose to say the same thing to them. And they match exactly. God's word will remain and will accomplish all that God has planned. The prophet Isaiah, through the power of the Holy Spirit, stated that God's word would remain forever. We see this in Chapter 40, verse 8. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. And then this was reaffirmed by the Apostle Peter when he quoted the same exact passage in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Now neither Isaiah nor Peter could make such statements without the understanding of God's preservation of Scripture. The Bible speaks of God's word remaining forever. It cannot and will not ever be lost or destroyed. It is eternal and everlasting. And though the world, the flesh, and the devil will try as they might to say otherwise, they have failed and will continue to fail to extinguish the truth. God's word was given specifically for mankind, for me, and for you. And it would not be fulfilling its purpose if it were not available to us. Romans chapter 15, verse 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. God's truth brings sight to the blind and hope to the lost. A person cannot be saved apart from the Gospel message. We see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Therefore, in order for the gospel message to proclaim, be proclaimed to the ends of the earth, the doctrines and truths of the word must be protected. If Scripture were not supernaturally preserved, there would be no way to ensure the consistency of the message it contains. Acts chapter 13, verse 47. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Now, secularists, and this is becoming a very popular movement these days, consider freedom to practice one's faith or belief without harming others or to change it or not have one according to one's own conscience. An agnostic doesn't believe it's possible to know for sure that a God exists. Buddhists believe that the human life is one of suffering 
and that meditation, spiritual and physical labor, and good behavior are the ways to achieve enlightenment or nirvana. Now, I personally, I, I just I can't understand it for the life of me. I can't entertain the idea of why these false religions and ideologies even draw people. Because you read the fine print, and none of them come with any guarantee, do they? There's no reward at the end. It's a lot of, well, possibly we hope. But the Word of God tells us what happens when we follow it. You see, there was no price paid to ensure that a favorable outcome exists for those that place their faith and trust in anything other than the finished work of Jesus Christ. If there is something out there, I'd like for you to show it to me because I I have yet to find it. And so I never try to take my faith for granted. Because when I sit down and think about God's truth and how it gets embedded on your heart if you allow it to, you know, it, it can get very overwhelming, can it not? When you think about the unspeakable generosity that God has shown to us. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I think about my soul sometimes and, and the way I behave, and I, I think, what a wretch that I am. You see, I know how destructive that I can be in my flesh. And I know how dark my thoughts can grow when I take my mind off of the truth. And that's why it's so important to always keep this close by. Jesus proclaimed that He is the way. He confidently said that He is the truth. And then He offers this. He says, I am the life. In Islamic tradition, death is the separation of the soul from the body and the beginning of the afterlife. People who perform several good deeds in the course of their life enter paradise. There's no pain, sickness, or sadness in paradise. But those that performed bad deeds, well, they enter into a life of hell. In hell, the person endures physical and spiritual suffering, much like what we believe, what the Word of God says, right? But then, here's the tricky part. Muslims believe that not all bad actions are punishable by hell. Allah is forgiving and compassionate to those who regret their actions and have performed certain good deeds in their lifetime. That's interesting. I've always been interested to know exactly what good works must a Muslim do in order to cover up and pay for their transgressions in order to enter into paradise. Because I always ask myself, who decides what is favorable, what is forgivable, and who decides what is unforgivable? What must you do from a deed standpoint to say, let's say, uh, to make up for breaking up a marriage and turning another man's home into utter chaos? What do you got to do to fix that? Or how can you ever make up for the pain and emotional distress caused to a grieving mother who lost her son or daughter due to senseless violence? What what, what must you do to, to make up for that? Well, I look at the Word of God, and the Word of God says there's absolutely nothing that we can do from a works-based standpoint. Does it not? We read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, the only thing that will come from our work will be an inflated ego and stronger sense of self-worth, will it not? It might even produce a godlike mentality that will harden your heart to Jesus and the work that He's trying to accomplish through you. The Word also tells us there's nothing redeemable in our flesh. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are filthy rags. 
And we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have been taken away, have taken us away. Our flesh is ruled by our heart. And the Bible has this to say about the heart. In Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Now, Christian, we need to be mindful and intentionally focused on the work that God gives us because each of us has a job to do for Him. Each of us has something to contribute to His kingdom. His work will always produce a bountiful crop And it will keep our heart and mind tender and surrender to the gospel if we're in it. If we're doing the work, that's a guarantee. A secularist. Secularists believe that, as with all other forms of life, there's absolutely no possibility of any life beyond clinical death for humans. Some atheists claim that humanity has invented the notion of life after death to ease the fear of death and the unknown. But again, when we look at the Bible, the Bible states otherwise. And we see this in a very familiar passage as a refutation to this way of thinking and a great illustration of the remorse that comes with this false way of believing. It's found in Luke chapter 16. It's the story of Lazarus and the beggar. Starting in verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked away at his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted. And thou art tormented. When I lived in Los Angeles, the chic thing to do was walk around with these uh, t-shirts that said Buddha's belly. If you were hip and cool, you wore it. And everybody wore it. But you see, in Buddhism, there's no concept of punishment or reward. And there's no divine being who decides who, who goes to heaven or hell. There's merely the illusory thought of word and deeds, which we call karma. And in the entertainment circles, they love to toss that word around. Karma. Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now Peter, after laming the beggar beautiful, and after seeing 5,000 men place their trust in Jesus, he's questioned by the high priest Caiaphas by what authority such things were accomplished. And Peter had this to say in Acts 4, verse 10. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel by that the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. And then he boldly continues in verse 12 and says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Allah cannot make such a statement because he has no power to save mankind. It was never Buddha's intention to save mankind. And the false gods of entertainment, pleasure, fame, money, power, selfishness, and instant gratification only add fuel 
to mankind's destruction. Jesus said unto Thomas over 2,000 years ago, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It was true then. It's true now. And it will remain true for all of eternity. And because of this reality, we can overcome anything, anything that this world throws at us. Just cast aside the fleshly desires and be disciplined to diligently follow the calling of Christ. And I want to close with a passage that I hope encourages you. And on those days that you don't feel very encouraged, that you feel like throwing out the towel, maybe you don't feel like rolling out of bed, think on this passage found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Well, Jesus, we are just so blessed. So blessed to call You Father. So blessed to look to You for direction. So blessed by Your provision, for Your protection, Your comfort, Your love, Your grace your long-suffering. And I know that you know we live in a challenging day and age. But the beautiful thing is, Lord, and I thank you for this, that you chose each of us here to be here at this moment. At any moment we could have been created, but you chose this time, and you did it for a reason, and that was to reach this world for you. And so I just pray for encouragement for my brothers and sisters here. I know we all have our own sets of challenges and stumbling blocks and adversities. And so I just lift them all up to you today. And I pray, God, that when they are in that spot where they're challenged, that they would remain strong and steadfast in their faith, that they would remain strong in their, your truth, and that they would just be guided by the Holy Spirit in all they do. And with today being the National Day of Prayer, Lord, I just ask, I ask for grace and mercy for this nation. I know we don't deserve it, but I can't help but believe that there's some people out there that if they only heard the good news, would turn from their wicked ways and bow their knee to you. May you be honored and glorified in the things that we say and do. And may you bring us back safely this Sunday. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.